need the Holy Spirit. Because it would be a chaos. Okay, right. like what do you mean? Because the Holy Spirit is working in church and pretty much telling... I don't want to say telling you what to do, but it's guiding you what to do, how okay. to do, how to, you know, you know what I mean? Like how to live a Christian life. Okay. Because if we don't have the Holy Spirit, we're pretty much a dead spirit. Okay. To me. Good answer. Anybody else? Who God is. Okay. Like, what do you mean by that? It, it, well, by how Holy Spirit works, it's it's showing us more of how God is, how He works in our lives. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Good answer so far. To comfort us. Okay. All right. To comfort. Maybe to help us with discernment. Okay. Not not just agreeing with you, but can you add a little? What do you mean? Well, like, um, say somebody is um, giving a word in church. Okay. Well, if it if it goes against the Bible. Kind of usually get that check in your spirit, mm -hmm. um, and um, to know, hey, I need to check this out to make sure if I should accept it or not. You know. Okay, good answer. Anything else? To direct us. Okay. Just to kind of keep us on on the path that we're supposed to be on. Okay. Anything else? Because he's part of the Trinity. Okay. Okay. I feel like if you leave leave the Holy Spirit out of the Trinity, you're you're not getting God to the fullest. Okay. Good answers. Anything else? To convict people of their need for a savior. Mm-hmm. Good answers. Now, keep thinking about this as we go, okay? We're gonna, I'm going to give you a few ideas. Um, the first that I want to mention is that the church without the Holy Spirit is not really the church. Um something I want to read is in, is in uh, Numbers. I know Numbers of all places, but yes, Numbers. Uh, chapter 11, verse 29. And it says this. Um, what's happened is um, Moses has the Holy Spirit. And so what happens is they get these other leaders, and God uh, pours out his Spirit on the leaders as well, on the other leaders as well. And so then, uh, some of them are prophesying in the midst of the camp, and uh, Mo and uh, Joshua comes to comes to Moses and tells him about it. And this is Moses' response: but Moses said to him, "Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put His Spirit on them?" Now this is um, kind of called I forget what it's called, but I'm going to call it descriptive prophecy. It's something that is. Is a, it's a state Moses said it as a statement, but it, it, it was actually um, a description of something that would come later in with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that all the people would be prophets. Um, I mean, we don't really know how – if Moses fully understood what was going to be happening in the future. I, I know a lot of the prophets, you can tell that they didn't really understand the prophecy necessary that they were giving to the fullest, you know. We don't really know how much uh, Moses understood about this, uh, but he was definitely did definitely. Um, this is definitely foreseeing a time a time when that would happen. It's also important to note that to the Jews, all the writers of the Old Testament were prophets. Moses was considered a prophet. 
the writer of First and Second Kings was considered a prophet. So I mean, the writer of Judges was considered a prophet. In fact, that was one of the requirements uh, for whether or not the Bible, I mean, that book was from God or not, whether it had the prophetic feel to it. So um, another thing, another one is in Joel chapter two, um, and I'm I'm really skipping over a lot of other things. I I, I don't want to spend too much time. Um, and this, I just kind of want to give you a rough idea. I can never find the uh, minor prophets. No, that's not right. Yeah. Okay, so Joel chapter 2, verse 28 says this, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Now, Peter, um, after the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit is first given to the church, he quotes this, but he doesn't quote it exactly. He says it like this, instead of, and it shall come to pass afterward, he says, um, and, in the, and it shall come to pass in the last days that this will happen. Um, thereby associating that this was you know, what, what has been prophesied for, for all those many years throughout the prophets. Uh, but you can read that um, through. Um, and then the second thing there is, is, so the church without the Holy Spirit really is not the church if you think about it. Um, God, you know, foresaw something else. And not only that, but he kind of, the church was really born with the Spirit of the Holy Spirit, you know, with the attitude of the Holy Spirit, with the, with the movement of the Holy Spirit. So then to say, you know, that's not really something that we need to emphasize kind of just contradicts everything the Bible was building towards. I mean, even before Jesus... Um, you know, died and, and everything and was resurrected, he told them, look, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, okay, and, and he's going to guide you to these other things. I'm going to go so that I can send the Holy Spirit. In fact, the, the Gospel of John says it like this, the Holy Spirit hadn't been given because Jesus hadn't yet been glorified. See what I mean? And so to it, it kind of builds up towards the, towards the fact that the church will be used in the power of the Holy Spirit, that they will have this guide with them, they will have this comforter with them, they will have this 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 leader with them, you know. Um, so yeah, and then the second off, the, Jesus without the Holy Spirit is not really Jesus. Gracie mentioned this to to say, okay, it's all about Jesus. Yeah, it, you know. I, I get it when, what people mean when they say that, but sometimes it, it sounds like some people mean it like this. It's all about Jesus. I mean, Jesus is a part of the Trinity. To, to, to ostracize Jesus and not talk about the Father, the Holy Spirit, this is the idea that people get. In the Old Testament times, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, they weren't there at all. It was just the Father, and he was this mean guy who was always yelling at people. Well, now Jesus has come, and he's the loving one, so we can all focus on Jesus and the Holy Spirit. He's just the weird one, so we don't really talk about him. You know what I mean? And it kind of gives off this idea there's there's three different gods, and that's yeah. not really how it is. One God. One God. You know, and, and so to talk about Jesus, you have to talk about the Holy Spirit. To talk about the Holy Spirit, you have to talk about the Father. To talk about the Father, you have to talk about Jesus. Yeah. Let's know the content of what Jesus says. He's always talking about... Um, I and the Father are one. I only speak as the Father speaks. You know, he's all, he always talks about this stuff. What well, what is he talking about? He's talking about the way that they are one. Yeah, so they're all tight. In Luke and Luke chapter three, verse I believe one. Yes. In the 15, uh, 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee and his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of... This doesn't sound right. <laughs> Chapter 3, verse 1? This doesn't sound right. Where was I? Yeah, there was the, the I I put the wrong reference here. Um, I think it's maybe four one. Yeah, and Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. Um, it's very important to note what he just said there. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, was led out into the wilderness. You know, I, I think that's kind of important there. One of the things that Luke emphasizes is the Holy Spirit, especially the Holy Spirit. Um, you, you see this, you see in Luke, you see Jesus constantly being led by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, the move of the Holy Spirit. And then you see him at the end of Luke, beginning of Acts, he dies, he gives the Holy Spirit to them. And then you see them mirroring what he just did. He, just like Elijah and Elisha, 
Elijah was a prophet who, who when he died, uh, set that down for Elisha, which was the Holy Spirit. And then we see the same thing happening here. Jesus, the great prophet, handing off the Holy Spirit to the church that we would continue his work. And so you see a parallel between the work of the Holy Spirit in Luke and, and the work of the Holy Spirit in Acts. You know, and uh, you kind of see, see this together. And, and Luke really emphasizes that point that Jesus wasn't just out there by himself. He was full of the Holy Spirit, you know, being moved by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 18, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Um, and that obviously being from uh, Isaiah. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set to, uh, at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then you hop down to chapter 24. So I am sorry, it says 3 1, that's 4 1, in case you're taking notes. Um, chapter 24, verse 49. And this is what he says. And behold, I am sending the promise of the Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. See, he even restricted the, ch the early church's movements and activity to nothing until the Holy Spirit was given because this was the next step. Now, obviously, he doesn't do the same nowadays because we aren't starting the church. See, at, at this point, it was essential that they didn't try and go off and do their own thing until they had the guidance and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. It was essential. Nowadays... I mean, the Holy Spirit is still needed, but in a different capacity. We aren't starting the church; we're spreading the church. See what I mean? A little bit of a different, a little bit of a difference. But I'm not saying the Holy Spirit is not needed. Rather, the Holy Spirit is continually needed to continue that mission. Um, however, sometimes you you do see people called into ministry without the Holy Spirit being um, them being filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, and then as they as they go, they have the opportunity later. Um, so it, it just happens sometimes. Um, and then, so Jesus without the Holy Spirit is not Jesus. Any, any questions on this so far? We're good? Okay. Third thing is witnessing is hindered. Um, I didn't write down a specific reference because it's really just read Acts. Read the New Testament. The Holy Spirit, you know, it, it, it talks about them a, a few different things. First off, don't worry about what you're going to say when you're arrested. The Holy Spirit will take care of that. You know, and then it says, uh, you know, about all these different things. Being moved by the Holy Spirit, they did this. Stephen, arrested, about to be killed, he's, you know, and everything. And then moved by the Holy Spirit, he said this. And then he looked into heaven, he saw this, and then he dies. You know what I mean? And so you see just this this, this phenomenal move of the Holy Spirit and, and, and what it's doing to the church and how it's, how it's guiding them. And... Uh, you know, and, and that's one of the things that the prophets emphasized was the day of the Lord with the movement of the Holy Spirit. And as you look in Acts, notice how 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 the how Luke emphasizes that in the book of Acts. Um, they go to set up the elders of the church because the pastors say, we don't have time to do everything. We need some people to do. And they say specifically, men who are f full of the Holy Spirit. And why that's important is because that's what the prophets were talking about in the Old Testament. You know? Uh, and so it, Luke isn't just saying it's a good idea to have leaders who are full of the Holy Spirit. He is saying that, but he's also saying this. This is what was prophesied. This is that. We're at the time. This is the end. This is the end of days. It, it's not like, oh, America, you know, all these things are going on. Now we're in the end times. No, it was the end times as soon as Jesus ascended. We are in the last days, that last stage. Now, the thing is, though, the Bible talks about the last days in a lot of different ways. And we really don't know how long the last days are. For instance, the last days could be longer than the days before the last days. We don't know. We, all we know is what the Bible refers to as the last days is in the last section of time. We are in the last section of time, the time of the church. And that will end at the time of the rapture, at the time of the new heavens and the new earth, at that time. Okay? So... The witnessing uh, is obviously going to be hindered. Uh, fourth off, we make it all about our abilities or our ent entertainment, right? Mm -hmm. um, the pastor has to do a good job, has to, has to stand the right way, dress the right way. The music has to be just right. Either you have to have a fog machine or whatever, light show, whatever. Um, you have to have a full band. It doesn't matter, you know, how – it doesn't matter their heart just as long as they've got talent. You know, I mean, everything is about the entertainment aspect. Um, it's all about our abilities. Um, how can we reach more people? You know what I mean? It's not how can we be led by the Holy Spirit to reach to reach the people. It's always how can what can we do to spice things up, to entertain people, to draw them in. You know what I mean? It's always that access of growing the church, not necessarily 
growing people into God's kingdom, but getting more people into your door so you can pat yourself on the back and say, look how many people we got in. Yeah. You know what I mean, and I think that's one of the problems that's kind of going on right now, and people are realizing in the, in the American church, and that's why Amer the American church is shrinking. You know, people realize, hey, we're kind of being confugled here. You know what I mean? People are kind of just, this isn't something that's getting into my heart. This is something where I'm coming and I'm paying tithes for these mega church pastors to go off and buy their really nice expensive houses. And we're just going through the same cycle every week. You know what I mean? They start realizing, hey, this, this, this isn't actually doing anything. And so you, what you have now is you have a disconnect between the people who are actually genuinely seeking after God and the people who are just kind of, I call them the milk suckers. Yeah. You know, when you when you have your cereal, we, we talked about this in the worship team, uh, when you have your cereal and it's just sitting in the milk and it just sops up all the milk, it doesn't have any flavor, it just gets all gooey and nasty. Yeah. So, I mean, and people get tired of doing that. People don't want to be, don't want to be milk suckers the whole time. Right. They... they, they 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 don't necessarily uh, want to seek after God, but they know that they don't want that. <laughs> right. So in our zeal to see God move, we oftentimes replace His move, excuse me, with a temporary high, rather than seeking after the Lord, praying, praying for praying for the Lord of the harvest as to, as to what to do. A lot of times we'll substitute by going to you know, um, and gr church growth seminars, and reading these books, and not that those things are bad. Those things are not bad, but sometimes it's all about the next high. The next hype that you can give to people. Um, you see, uh, a lot of times, seeker-sensitive churches will do this exact same thing. You know, um, well, people don't like it when we have crosses in our church, so we're going to remove all the crosses, and we're going to make it look like a regular building, whatever. Oh, well, now they're into crosses again. Put the crosses back up. You know what I mean? It, it, it's just a thing about how can we be more preppy than, than – than we aren't supposed to be preppy. No. You know what I mean? We, we're supposed to be with the times in the sense that, you know, reaching the people who with the questions that they actually have – but that doesn't mean that we need to we need to tear down the church and rebuild a new building every single time that, that, that fads change. See what I mean? Uh, the, the church has to be about God. And so sometimes in our zeal to see God move, we actually cut short God moving because we're in too big of a rush. Yeah. Think of it like this. Sometimes on Sundays when a word is being given, sometimes it takes a while, right? Mm -hmm. How easy would it be to just, okay, we're going to the next thing? Yeah. Because we don't, want, we don't want to irritate people. We want to see God move. But in doing that, you cut short God moving. Exactly. See what I mean? And people do the exact same thing with different planning with the church. So um, you guys, honestly, I can say this with absolute confidence. You guys are really lucky living in, living in Torosa with with this church here. Pastor is extremely um, gifted in this area. You should have seen some of the places I've been. In. Let's just say the pastors didn't handle it very great. So <laughs> I've been around, uh, you know, and, and I can honestly say that without any any um, any lack of confidence. So it was the Holy Spirit um, in the Old Testament. Okay, can you give me some examples? Zach, you want to start? Uh, it's okay if you don't. No, I don't know. Why I'm top of my head. Okay, that's fine. Does anybody have any examples off the top of their head? Genesis. Okay, Genesis chapter one. <clears throat> Anybody else? Or anything else? You, if you have another answer, you can. Kidding me now? <laughs> what? I'm going to the wrong page. <laughs> oh, man. Was it Gracie's? Oh. So does anybody else have any answers about uh, the Holy Spirit? Moses, probably. Okay. When you fight the Red Sea. Okay. I don't think I can really think of it. Okay. Anything else? Didn't it say that the Spirit led Moses into the wilderness? Mm -hmm. no. I'm not positive. Okay. I am. Um, I want to say yes. Yeah. Can you look on your phone? Did you bring it? I'm not positive. I may be confusing it with Jesus when he's being tempted. Right, right. The, uh, yeah, I know that. We, we, we read that one. And I think it's real similar with, with, with what Nicole was saying about um, uh, with, with the parting of the, or the recipe. I mean, we know that the Holy Spirit was at work, but I don't know for sure if it says 
anything about the, the Spirit of God or the power of God. You know, I, I, don't think, I don't know if it mentions anything like that. I mean, we know it was by the power of God, so... Yeah, right. Find anything? Well, you guys can have more chips and salsa. Just because I hoarded it doesn't mean that I'm hoarding it. <laughs> Really good, huh? Find anything, Chuck? No? Hmm. Well, if you guys do find that, uh, bring it next week, or next week's canceled. You okay? I just ran into one of the couch. Yeah, that hurts. I know from experience. Um, That reminds me, guys, next week is canceled. Because of the Valentine's Day. We'll be at the Valentine's Day thing instead. Okay. Glad I mentioned that. <laughs> um, well, we can do it there. I'm kidding. Right? <laughs> Let me just check something. Okay. Um, so the first thing about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament is that it wasn't given in the same way as it was today. Okay. Um, I, I've mentioned this before, and that's one of the highlights that the New Testament emphasizes, is that in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was not given to all. Okay. It wasn't poured out among people. Okay. It was given to specific people at specific times for specific purposes, but sometimes the Holy Spirit would move on a person one time and they'd never, never experience it again. Okay. This is both a blessing and a curse. Okay. I'll, I'll give you an example of how it's a blessing. When the Holy Spirit came on the prophets and they prophesied, there wasn't, there were a bunch of fake prophets, yes, mm -hmm. but there wasn't a bunch of whack job super spiritualist. It's the Holy Spirit when it wasn't the Holy Spirit. So in a way, it was, it was a blessing because <laughs> you knew when it was it the was power of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but uh, nowadays, people have mysticized it so much. I mean, it might be the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't know. And it's like, well, I mean, if you don't know, it probably isn't. You know, it, it, the Holy Spirit, when, when he moves, you, you just know it. You know, it's not something you can necessarily, this is what it feels like, and this is what you think. And it, I mean, <laughs> it, it's not like that. You just, right. it, it's not something you can really explain that well. Um, so it was not given to all. However, it was given to some, and one of the people that we see it go to were were uh, people by the name of Behel, Beholiab and yeah. Bezalel. In Exodus chapter 31, the Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Be um, Bezalel, the son of Uri, the, uh, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all of craftsmanship. So they're getting ready to build the tabernacle, um, not the temple. This is when they were out in the desert before the temple was ever conceived by King David. This was the tabernacle. It was a movable thing. Okay, It was like a giant tent. Um, or I'm sorry. At first it was a giant tent until they had the tabernacle, fin tabernacle finished. The tabernacle was a giant walled perimeter with a little building inside of that that they broke down and carried around that had the... the um, Ark of the Covenant in there, and, and the table, and the showbread, and the table, and all that nonsense. Okay, not nonsense, all that stuff. Um, so, okay, we see right here the Holy Spirit moving, and it says very, very specifically, um, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God. This is the Holy Spirit. Um, they said they said they said it a little bit differently, in account that this was way before the church was started mm -hmm. and you know that and they wrote differently at the time but it's still the exact same thing the holy spirit um and so we see him giving uh, giving skills to certain people presumably for a limited limited time mm -hmm. we don't know it says specifically i filled them to do this task right. so i'm assuming that once they finished the task it was the holy spirit left I, i'm assuming it's never really stated after this it really doesn't mention that again. Um, it was poured on, on leadership. Um, and this includes Moses. It includes the leaders that Moses appointed. Um, after Moses uh, goes on to die, it says very specifically that the Holy Spirit then went. Uh, um, it, Joshua was filled with the Holy Spirit. It was given to uh, different judges at different times, and it was also given to different kings at different times. Right, yes. Yeah. Sorry, I, I, I was thinking about something else. Uh, yes. Um, numbers 11, 17. And there's something else I was going to say. Um, well, yeah, in fact, does anybody know what the word Messiah means? 
the anointed one. So Jesus, the Messiah, he was the special anointed one of God. Uh, obviously, there were other anointed ones, but there's only one anointed one. See what I mean? Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah. There were other people anointed by God, but there's only one um, anointed. Exactly. Like, uh, for instance, it talks about Jesus being the Son of God. Now, I've talked about this, how Jesus wasn't eternally begotten. He became Jesus when he was born of the Virgin Mary, right? Mm -hmm. He was still God before that, but he was not born, he was not the Son of God until he had been born of the Virgin Mary, right? Mm -hmm. Right? So, um, with that being said, um, it calls him the Son of God, right? But we are, we are sons of God, mm -hmm. right? But there's only one Son of God. Right. See what I mean? It's the exact same kind of an idea there. We've been adopted in as, in as heirs because of his sacrifice, right? But he is the only actual God, man, God, man. Okay. We're, we're the step ones, right? Do what? We're, we're the, the steps. Step <laughs> we're the redheads. <laughs> uh, numbers uh, chapter step eleven. Signs, you know, the yeah, signs. yeah. Uh, numbers chapter eleven, verse seventeen says, uh, "And I will come down and talk with you there, and I will take some of the spirit that is on you and put it on them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with you, so that you may not bear it yourself alone." Now, what we do is we get the idea of this. Okay, this chip, this chip is Moses. Okay, this. This awesome salsa, that's the Holy Spirit. So what we, we think is, okay, that he had a measure of the Holy Spirit, right? But then he said he's going to give some of that to, to these other people. So he just kind of like poured off from that, right? That's not really what he's saying. It, it, it sounds like that's what he's saying, but that's not really what he's saying. What he's saying is, that spirit that's on you, okay, I'm going to take that. I'm going to put some on, on, on them too. Not I'm going to take from you and put it on them. Does that, make, does that make sense? Yeah, well, that's yeah, because yeah, the Bible says, "Well, I'm gonna take some from you and give it to the second." Right. You know, like, uh, right. Does that mean Moses has lasso? Right, exactly, and, and it does right. sound like that, but that's not really what you're saying. I went, I, I especially researched that because I was like, if I if they don't ask, I'm still curious. <laughs> like, what does this mean? <laughs> so, um, and then we see it also with prophecy, Numbers chapter twenty-three, verse five. Says this. Now, Balaam is is not a god follower. He's a pagan. He doesn't really worship one god over the other. He just kind of floats with a, with whatever. He's a, modern day equivalent would be um, a seer or a uh, what's some other word for median, a fortune teller, yeah. one of them. Okay, um, kind of just a hired prophet. Yeah. Which, if you've been going to Wednesday nights at all, you know what pastors already taught about this. So I don't need to. Um, chapter 23, verse 5. And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return to Balak, and thus you shall speak. And he returned to him, and behold, all the princes of Moab. And so he goes, and I think like three to five times somewhere. Let's see, second or third or fourth, final order. Four times. Four times the Holy Spirit moves on Balaam, and he gives these prophetic utterances. Um, and we know it was the Holy Spirit, not necessarily because it says the Holy Spirit, but because that's what the Holy Spirit does. When, when there's prophetic words, that's the move of the Holy Spirit. And the New Testament clarifies this because the Old Testament really didn't. Um, yeah. And then in 2 Kings 2.9, I also wanted to read this one. Oops, wrong way. Chapter 2, verse 9. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, which these are the two prophets I was just mentioning, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please, let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. Um, another, another, uh, Once again with the double portion, this is another way of saying, Let me continue the work that you're doing. Right. Okay. Once again, not saying, Hey, uh, well, this is what I have the Holy Spirit. The right. And so he's going to like multiply that, multiply. and then you've got two Holy Spirits in you. You know, it doesn't, that's not really <laughs> that's what he's saying. Um, once again, sometimes things are kind of lost because it was a long time ago. You know what right. I mean? People have different ways of talking. I'm sure if if you talked in Christianese like modern Christians do to Paul, the Apostle Paul, I'm sure he would say, he Paul, would like, what, what do you mean? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and not just because he doesn't speak English, <laughs> but <laughs> because it's like, <laughs> this is foreign uh, to me. Yeah. Um, so just some ideas, or, or not some ideas, but some books. Um, if you want more in... Um, what Luke has to say about the Holy Spirit and how that relates to the Old Testament, I highly encourage the Charismatic Theology of St. Luke. Here's the thing, though, guys. It is definitely a graduate-level read. In other words, 
uses lots and lots of really big words. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so if that's not your kind of book, you might not want to read this one because this is a graduate level read. <laughs> Um, then the second one is also by him. It's kind of like part two, and it's called the Pro the prophethood of all believers. Basically, what it does starts off um, kind of summarizing what the charismatic theology of Saint Luke already said, and then he goes and says, okay, now this is how um, the Acts shows the Book of Acts shows believers as prophets. Okay, and uh, really a, a great read if you if you're into graduate level books. <laughs> if not, it's a very difficult read. <laughs> I know one person asked to borrow it, and I let them borrow it, and uh, they didn't really like it. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. So, um, all right, It's definitely not something that you can just sit down and read for a, a, a Sunday afternoon. You know what I mean? It's something that you actually have to have brain power for. I, 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 I can only read it if I've had enough sleep, if I've eaten something, and there's nothing else going on. You know what I mean? Then I can read it. But otherwise, I'm just like, ah, I'm reading the same sentence over again. It still doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Um, so a few things. First off, the Holy Spirit isn't predictable. Sometimes, you know, we look at the at the New Testament and we say, okay, 1 Corinthians says that this is the different things that the Holy Spirit does, right? But is that list exhaustive? Well, some people would say yes and some people would say no. We're going to look at it more over the next coming weeks. I don't really want to comment one way or another. Um, if you're interested in what pastor believes and what how, what he has been teaching, mm -hmm. he believes that in the New Testament, um, uh, that list that, that Paul gives in 1 Corinthians is an exhaustive list. That is everything the Holy Spirit does. I, I'm really undecided on my view um, because in, in Exodus, for instance, it says about how the Holy Spirit enabled them with a the spirit of craftsmanship. And that's not really mentioned in 1 Corinthians, so I'm a little bit curious. Yeah. I haven't really had the t chance to talk to the pastor because we've got a lot of st stuff going on. Um, but that's kind of where I want to just leave it. I'm not quite sure what my view is. But I do know this. There's a lot of crazy beliefs out there about what the Holy Spirit does. Okay, And I would say 99% of them are wrong. Mm -hmm. They're just stupid. A, it, the Holy Spirit doesn't do something by himself. He always does things to build up the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? He's not lone rookie out there off doing his own thing you know that, that's not the holy spirit <laughs> and also he doesn't move people with the spirit of anger he doesn't move people to chaotic things that they just had to tell people and set them straight he doesn't do that um he he's not going to use you in this super you know out of the ordinary way like okay this is how the holy spirit uses everybody else but for me he has called me to this special ministry um, I'm above gossip and complaining. I'm above, you know, arrogance and all that stuff because I have this special gift of the Holy Spirit. And I'm humble. And I'm humble. It's like, yeah. mm, pause. You know what I mean? I, I have I have a real problem. So I definitely see what pastor's saying. You know what I mean? I, I definitely see what pastor's saying. I'm just a little bit confused still. So that's why I say the Holy Spirit isn't predictable. It's not like this is the way that the Holy Spirit moves every single time. Okay? We see in our church a lot of people move by the Holy Spirit to give a word, right? But... Not all people are going to be using that same way. Some people are going to use different things, like gift of healing, for instance. I mean, we're going to talk about this more over the next couple weeks. What does that mean? What is a word of knowledge? What is a word of encouragement? What is the the gift of healing or gifts of healing? Kind of like, well, I don't really know. So we're going to, we're going to look at that, okay? Um, but then also, he does always act according to God's word. Whatever the Holy Spirit does, regardless of whether the list in, in 1 Corinthians is, is everything that he does or not, the Holy Spirit will always act according to God's word. Mm -hmm. He never does anything that is contrary to God's word. Right. Okay, which means it's He's going to build people up. Mm -hmm. He's going to encourage people. He's going to point the way to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He's going to say things that are that are biblical, and He's not going to say anything that's not biblical. See what I mean? These are tests that we that we can put it through, and we'll talk more over the next coming weeks about different tests to see if it's a move of the Holy Spirit or just a move of self will. Mm -hmm. um, but for now, I just kind of leave that there. Um, do we have a complete list of what the Holy Spirit does? I'm not sure. I'm not I sure. So. I, I really don't know. Um, it. I'm really not sure. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna think about it. I'm gonna pray about it. I'm gonna talk to Pastor. Mm -hmm. And in two weeks when we come back, I'm gonna tell you what my view is. Okay. Because okay. I don't. Ha I'm not. I'm not finished with the details yet. <laughs> so kind of trying to figure it out. So uh, any questions about that? Okay, cool. Um, 
how do you think the Old Testament stories would be changed without the Holy Spirit working? Uh, how so? What would be different, do you think? Well, this is your own opinion. There wouldn't be a lot of miracles that happen to... You do know we're talking about the Old Testament, oh, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, That's fine. Yeah. No, to... Give examples to show the, show people that God is trying to teach them certain things, trying to lead the people. I'm not really getting what you're saying. Maybe not. I need to think about that. Okay, do you want me to come back to you? Yeah. Because I'm, I'm, I'm not really getting what you're saying. I think I'm, I'm getting. It might have just been me. Yeah. No, no, no. Because I, you know, I get distracted when when there's a bunch of kids, going, you know, talking and stuff. Uh, did anybody else have, have, have something? Or we give to Zach time to think about that. I think it, uh, the stories would be different in matter of get, maybe being worse. Okay, like what do you because, mean? Because you know, uh, the pro uh, the prophets had the Holy Spirit, so they had you know God would talk to the prophets, like let's say talk to Moses face to face. Mm -hmm. And the people of Israel had some kind of guidance how to go by the, but if Moses didn't have the Holy Spirit, yeah. they wouldn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. They would just go their own way. Right. Yeah, yeah, good point. And I would I would say about the same every prophet in the Old Testament. Yeah. If they didn't have the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit was not, uh, it would be a uh, just a world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. Without the Holy Spirit working, would there ever have been prophets? Right. Right. See so what I mean? Right. Because if a prophet, if a prophet speaks, what what Peter says is not according to their own with their own things, but as they were moved upon by the Holy Spirit, is what Peter says. Mm -hmm. right. Would there ever have even have been prophets? Right. Well, let's look at let's look at how big of a chunk that that would be in your Bibles. <laughs> Right here is the prophet Malachi. He's the last um, prophet in the Old Testament. Okay, and right here, oh, went right just past it. And right here is the first prophet. That's a good yeah. chunk of your Bible that are just books of the prophets. Right. That's. Would that even exist without the movement of the Holy Spirit? I don't know. Mm -hmm. If it did exist, it probably would have been in a smaller form. Because <coughs> Second Timothy also says this. It says that the Holy Spirit was breathed out by God. God inspired. Well, isn't that the work of the Holy Spirit? Yeah. So one could technically argue that we might not even have a Bible without the movement of the Holy Spirit. Right. Without the Holy right. Spirit. So did, did you have time to think about what you were saying? Uh, Kind of. Just forget it. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I didn't. I hope I didn't no, embarrass no, no, no. you. Right no, no. Okay. Cool. Um, anybody else have something to say about this? I just kind of agree with. Diana. Yeah. I think Danny. I think you were right on. I think you were right on. Yeah. I mean, even if you just think about the different story, the different stories of the Bible. Yeah. Uh, the two prophets, Elijah and Elisha, that I mentioned, right? They crossed over the water. That wouldn't Everything have happened. Everything would have been just changed. Right. Uh, the leper that was healed, that wouldn't have happened. Uh -uh. I mean, look at the, uh, Jeremiah. Yeah. Job. Yeah. Nothing would have... Yeah. Would have been, it would have been changed. It would have... Yeah. And so a lot of times... You, you know what, what's, what's unique about the book of Esther? God isn't mentioned at all. God is not mentioned at all. Huh. At but all. You see them working... All through it. He, you know, I already know where I'm going with this. I was reading it yesterday. <laughs> he knows exactly where I'm going with this. In the old, We're talking about it tomorrow night. So. In the Old Testament, you don't necessarily hear the writers say the Holy Spirit, who is a distinct person and not just the power of God. I mean, it's in there, but not always in that many words. You know what I mean? It's not really fleshed out as well. I mean, it's in there. Obviously. But not until the New Testament do you really start to understand what the Old Testament is saying. 
But he's there the whole time. Just like in Esther, God's there moving, saving his people, working through Esther, working through um, the uncle, um, um, Mordecai. Mordecai. He's there the whole time. He strategically placed people in, and, and he made sure that Mordecai was able to get to Esther. And just this whole thing that he, that he, that he but it never mentions his name. See what I mean? And so we see the work and the work and the movement of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. We just didn't necessarily know that it was what what for sure we were seeing. Right. Another thing is, and we're going to talk about this later, so I don't really want to talk about it too much. But um, we see the Holy Spirit moving on um, uh, the king before David, Saul, uh, and you know he's he's. I don't really want to get into it yet, but but he was uh, really the, the Holy Spirit moved on him, and, and he was prophesying with the rest of the prophets, and allowed David the chance to escape. <laughs> right. You know, and and so you you see that that just amuses me. The Holy Spirit is and ah! not 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 to, not necessarily because he was seeking him or anything, but just because he's like ah whatever right. <laughs> that's that's it's just funny how that works. But anyways, um, what do the works of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament mean for us today? And if you guys don't understand this question, that's fine. I'll just kind of plow ahead. It, it, there was no other way that I could think of to word it. Any ideas? But there was a God Dan, and then there's a God now. Yeah. And what more specifically about that God? Um, people... Um, Rely, uh, not rely. Let me see. Let me see how I put it. You're on the right track, of what I wanted to emphasize. <laughs> that he was still loving today as he was back then. They That's re true. They relied really what? On God for guidance back then, mm -hmm. which was the Holy Spirit's word, just like we rely on God now. Right. Right. And with that reliance, there was. The Holy Spirit moving. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so if he moved back then in such greatness, when he wasn't poured out, now that he has been poured out, see what I mean? Mm. Surely the church can, can, can definitely move forward, right? Yeah. More than ever has been done before. Right. Because the Holy Spirit has been poured out. We don't have one Moses. We have the whole church. See what I mean? Yeah. So, um... The Holy Spirit accomplishes mighty things. That's who he is. He did it in the Old Testament. He'll do it in the New Testament times. That's who he is. Um, so uh, some things between uh, between the Testaments that I want to say, talk about. When people talk about the 400 years of silence, they talk about the last prophet of the Old Testament, Malachi, mm -hmm. to, the, to when, when the first uh, events of the New Testament happened, the Gospel of Matthew, and there was a 400-year gap between that time. Mm. Not to say that God wasn't moving, that God had forgotten people, but there were no more um, spirit-inspired things, you know, uh, writings going on. There was no more major works, uh, moves of the Holy Spirit. You know, He was still working in people. Right. Okay. But mostly there wasn't a whole lot of stuff going on. Uh, and to to make it more complicated, uh, what happened was after Persia allowed Israel to go back to the Promised Land, um, eventually Alexander the Great left uh, led his armies through in the 330s. Right. And after he, pretty much as soon as he conquered everything, he died. I think it was like a couple months afterwards. I'm not quite sure. It's yeah. been a long time since I studied that. And so his his empire was divided up between uh, four di four different generals. Oh yeah. I believe four, or either Three four or five. Four. Um, and d this is actually what what the prophet <laughs> Daniel prophesied about. I, are you okay? Yeah. Now, uh, this is actually what the prophet Daniel prophesied about when he talked about the little horns and stuff. We'll talk about that uh, probably later. But um, and after that, there was kind of some warring between two two of the general uh, two of the generals, you know, off not not offspring, but the people who took off after them, took over after them, until finally the Israelites just kind of revolted. And this is when um, revolted, not revolted, revolted. And this is where we get the books of the Maccabees. It's not in our Bible, but if you've ever heard about the books of First, Second, and Third Maccabees, there's a Fourth Maccabees, but it has nothing to do with the rest of them. Um, anyways, uh, that's where that fits in, and that's what's going on there. Just a bunch of different fights amongst the Israelites and amongst themselves, and just nothing really is going on. And then uh, eventually, to, uh, two of the Israelite leaders 
you know, try to go at it, and, and they, neither of them really get the upper hand. So then they get this um, this Roman guy to come in and help, and he just never leaves. And therefore, the Roman occupation begins, and that leads us into the time of Jesus. So really nothing major happening spiritually among right. the people of Israel. There's a bunch of political things happening, but uh. none of it really matters. And then, you know, Jesus comes. But in the midst of this, I, w I want to look at something that's very important. The, God was still moving in people. You know, maybe there weren't these great big things going on, but God hadn't forgotten people in the 400 years. Um, and I think that's important to realize because sometimes we think, so what, God just sat back and he wasn't moving in people, he wasn't speaking to anybody? Yeah, just, yeah. Maybe he wasn't doing as much as he had been before as far as, you know, all these big grand prophets and everything, right? Yeah, right. But we know that God is not a God who just sits back and lets people go to hell. You know what I mean? We know that he's an act of God. And just because um, he didn't move in the same way doesn't mean he wasn't moving at all. One evidence of this is in Luke chapter 1, verse 67. Um, it says this, And his father Zachariah, Zachariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, this is before Jesus was born, and yet his cousin? Michael. Right, because... John is this. Yes, yes, yes. If, yeah, okay. Yeah. Man, oh man. I am out of it, Chuck. Thank God you're here. You know what happened if you weren't here? I would have been sitting here for the next five minutes trying to figure out what the heck he was. Yes, 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 yes. What he said. Um, the uncle uh, is, is being used of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 2, verse 25. Okay. And now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation, consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. There's another person. So now, moving on down to uh, verse 36 of chapter 2, it says, And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She would advance in years, having lived with her husband seven years, and so on. So here we have three people, just mentioned right here, who are being used of the Holy Spirit. So... Yes, God was still moving, but there weren't any new revelations during that time. And I also want to say this. As the time for the Messiah to come approached, mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit was doing more things to get people ready. See what I mean? Uh, and so it just, it just happened that these people, fully the Holy Spirit, were at this place at this time? No. So, I mean, as the time of the Messiah came closer, the Holy Spirit was doing things to, to prepare their hearts to prepare the way, just as John the Baptist was going preparing the way, right? And then as Jesus died and was uh, was resurrected and ascended, the Holy, the Holy Spirit was given out to everyone, okay? Um, once again, uh, it was kind of hit or miss in the Old Testament time. Anything before Jesus was kind of just hit and miss. Um, the Holy Spirit just kind of did as he willed. Nowadays, I mean, he still does as he wills, okay? But... Um, all people can seek for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So, um, what questions do you have concerning the Holy Spirit specifically? Because I want to make sure we talk about it in this discussion. Diana, you want to get in on this? Any questions you specifically have concerning the Holy Spirit so we can study it over the next couple weeks? Maybe something happens in church and you don't really understand it. Maybe you're reading something and you just don't understand it. Kind of, I don't know really how to phrase it, but the only thing that's going to come to mind is like, how do you know if, like, how do you feel if it's the Holy Spirit? Like, are there certain signs? Or I don't like it. I don't really have to. Like, if the Holy Spirit is is moving through you, how can you be sure that it is? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other any other questions that you like for us to look at over the over the course of this discussion on the Holy Spirit? No. If you guys think about something throughout the week. Okay, write it down or send me a text, okay? 
you guys all have my number, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, or you can shoot an email through Facebook. Or if you have my email, email you can you can do that. Uh, or you can write it down and bring tell it to me next week. Or not next week. Two weeks. <laughs> I, I better not be the only person who, for, who <laughs> does, forgets and comes to yams and stuff like that. <laughs> okay. But just keep thinking about that, okay, guys? So let's look at Jesus as a prophet. Because what happens is uh, Luke especially contrasts Jesus as a great prophet. Mm -hmm. If you read through Luke, I mean, it's just so evident. The, the Old Testament passages that he references... Um, the works of Jesus that he references. I mean, just so many different things. Um, so let's look at let's look at Elijah, okay? In First Kings, chapter seventeen, verse one. And we're gonna go by the and go down these one by one, okay? So if you have any questions, don't don't be afraid to ask. Uh, seventeen one says this. Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishba in Gilead said to Ahab. As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before what I, whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Okay, so here we have the prophet in control of nature. Okay, in 1717, we have, after this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill, and his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. Um, and she said to Elijah, What have you uh, against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. And he said to her, Give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him down on his bed. And he cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow? I'm sorry. Yes, even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the, of the child came into him again, and, revi and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. So here we have someone being raised from the dead. And then if you go back um, to verse 16, it says, The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. Now, um, if you want to go back and read the whole story, it starts in verse 8 and it goes through verse 16. Um, and it's basically the, the, this, I mean, I think the, the chart sums it up pretty well. Uh, the food was multiplied. <laughs> And so now let's look at Elisha. Elisha is the prophet that was after Elijah. He was kind of, um, uh, Elijah mentored him for a while, and then when he died, he just kind of took over the role for Elisha. Um, and so that's in 2 Kings chapter 2. Does anybody have any questions so far? Okay. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse uh, 14? Yes, 14. Then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. So here again, we have uh, the prophet in control of, of nature. Chapter... <coughs> Sorry. Which one was it that made the axe head float? That was... Um, I, I want to say it was Elisha at the beginning of the book. Let me check <coughs> It must have been uh, Elijah. It must have been Elijah. Uh, I'm not positive, though. Um, okay, so then in chapter 4, verse 34, it says... Um, then he went up and lay, uh, and lay on the child, putting his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, and his hand on his hands. And as he stretched himself upon him, the flesh of the child became warm. Then he got up again and walked uh, once back and forth in the house and went up and stretched himself upon him. The child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. Then he summoned Gehazi and said, call, call the Shunammite, and it goes on and whatnot. But basically, the moral of the story that's going on here... The 
overall the story of what's going on here um, is that uh, the dead was raised. And then if you hop back to verse 3 of the same uh, chapter. It's Elisha in chapter 6. Oh, it is Elisha? Okay. Um, chapter 4, verse 3, it says, Then he said, Go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels and not too few. Then go in and shut the door behind yourself and your sons and pour into all these vessels. And when one of... One of uh, and when one is full, set it aside. So basically, um, he, she has this thing of oil. And so they borrow as many pots as they can, and they keep filling up the other ones with oil with the same thing. God keeps multiplying and multiplying. And then when they have no more jars left, it stops multiplying. So then they take all that, and they sell it, and they use the money um, to take care of this. You can read the story there, but um, to take care of the different things that they were in need of. And then down in chapter 5, verse 8, so there, again, we have multiplying food. Chapter 5, verse 8. Um but when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. Um, and so what's going on here is there's this outsider. His name is Naaman. And he has leprosy. And long story short, he's held of leprosy um, in this story here. You can read it for yourself. Uh, but once again, uh, we have a healing, okay? Now, if you look on the chart specifically, okay, Elijah is not has doesn't have any recorded stories of being uh, of healings uh, of leprosy, okay? Mm -hmm. However, Jesus does, okay? Yeah. So let's keep that in mind. And then uh, at the bottom, it says similar message to prophets. I only I'm only going to include one reference because you could literally teach for weeks on the different things that the Gospels have to say is relating to the prophets. Jesus' message is relating to the prophets. Really, I don't think people realize this, but the Gospels have a lot of references to the books of the prophets. A lot of references to the books of the prophets. Okay, mm -hmm. Honestly. You can just go back and forth, read the prophets, read the Gospels, read the prophets, read the Gospels. Hmm. I'm not even going to waste the time in this lesson. It's just there's too much. So now let's look at what Luke has to say specifically. Because remember, each of the different writers of the Gospels emphasize, emphasize different things. Luke specifically emphasizes the movement of the Holy Spirit and Jesus as a prophet. Okay, So Luke chapter 8, verse 22. And you can, you can catch the different themes, not just in these passages, but you can see the different themes that he kind of brings up as you read it through. Um, if you want, you can spend the next two weeks and just read the Gospel of Luke and pay specific attention to the the, pro the idea of Jesus as a prophet, and you'll see it everywhere. Um, Luke chapter 8, verse 22. One day he got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, Let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he woke. And rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. He said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even wind and water, and they obey him? So once again, we have a contrast between the prophets controlling nature, Jesus also controlling nature. Mm -hmm. um, raising the dead, in chapter 7, verse 14, which I believe this is the only gospel to, re to, tell, to that has this story in it. Um, verse 14, you know what, let's start in verse 11. Soon afterward he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples in a great crowd with him uh, went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. Already a lot of details are very similar to the story that we read of the prophet, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the uh, the buyer. How do you say that word? Beer? <laughs> buyer? I don't know. And the bearer stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. Now, this is a big deal because for 400 years, the people of Israel really haven't had a real big spiritual revival going on. Right. The prophet, the great prophets of old, they're no more. And so here, <laughs> their, their statement brings a very powerful statement in the Gospels. Jesus as the Messiah, the anointed one that has been long expected. Jesus as the prophet, the great the great spiritual reviver. Jesus as the king. See what I mean? So you have these, these different... And you have to put yourself back then as a Jew 
this was a very a time of excitement, but it was also a time of confusion. Right. They're not really sure what's going on, and then, you know, you know what I mean. Um, so, mm -hmm. anyways, um, so we see Jesus in control of nature, just like the prophets. He raised the dead, just like the prophets. And then in chapter nine, a little bit later, uh, verse twelve, we see him uh, w multiplying food. I uh, will start in verse ten. On the return of the apostle, um, on the return, the apostles told him all that they had done. <clears throat> and he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds learned it, they followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and uh, cured those who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside, countryside to find lodging uh, and get provisions, for we are here in a desolate place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. <clears throat> They said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we are to go and buy food for all these people. For there was about 5,000 men. That's He specifies men because there were also women and children. Um, and he said to his disciples, Have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so, and, and, and had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Um, then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left um, over was picked up twelve baskets of broken pieces. So again, we have these great things that the prophets did. You know, always with Luke, it's this contrast between Jesus is one of these great prophets. Um, because Jesus was a prophet. You know, he was the Messiah, but he was also a prophet. Just like he is also our great high priest. Just like he is also our king. Yes. See? So, um, Luke chapter 5, verse 12. Just like Elisha had done, here Jesus um, heals someone with leprosy. In verse uh, 12. While he was in one of the cities, there came <coughs> a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand. And touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your clen uh, um, cleansing as Moses commanded for proof to them. And then um, one more thing I want to look at is the fact that Jesus, not just Jesus' con conduct, but also Jesus' message was very similar to the prophets. Okay, um, Luke chapter 6, verse 9 through 10 specifically, I, I want to look at this. Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? And after looking around at them all, he said to, said to him, stretch out your hand. And this is the wrong passage, guys. Uh, I am not joking. This is the wrong passage. That is very upsetting. I'm not happy about that. Hmm. Okay. I believe it's here. Luke chapter 8. Verse 9 through 10. So I was close. I had the verses right. Uh, and when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now check out what the prophet Isaiah already prophesied hundreds of years before in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 10. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Very similar message. So once again, um, and that's just one example, but y y there's so much more that I could have said. But I, I, really the idea that I want to get across here is Jesus as the prophet. Because this prophet gave us the same spirit that he had so that we could continue on his work. And what was his work? The kingdom of God. Right. So what is our work? The kingdom of God. We have access to the same spirit. He has poured it out for us. He was glorified, so now the Holy Spirit has been given. 
So, um, any questions on that? Okay. So then the question of the week. What are some evidences of the Holy Spirit? This is actually, I believe, kind of in line with what Nicole was saying. It's similar. Um, she was more asking, how do you know if it is the Holy Spirit, I think. And this is more, what are some evidences of the Holy Spirit? So kind of similar. Any questions before we finish this up for the day? <laughs>